All right, welcome everybody. We got our good friend Kurt Walker Jr. for uh for all of us again. He he was on the show a couple months back and uh you know, he's been record reporting on the uh, Copa v. Wright case every single day uh, inside the courtroom. Uh and you know, he's he's just really an influential guy that I'm so happy to be friends with and I'm looking forward to seeing him seeing you again Kurt in a couple uh just about 8 or 9 days in San Francisco. So, how you doing, yeah. buddy? Good to have you back. Good. Uh, you know, never, never a dull moment. I got uh, two little kids and a pregnant wife and uh, working, working gorilla pool and doing dev projects and coin geek stuff and then the extra court coverage. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, try, trying to find time to sleep is uh, a challenge, but, uh, but I'm having a good time. So I, I, I chose this life for a reason. So, uh, just as a quick plug, uh, you know, next weekend you're flying out to San Francisco, right? You, yep. We're going to be hanging out with everybody. So can you just you talk about your involvement in that and give a plug on that? Yeah, for sure. So, um, it, well, it's the S script hackathon, uh, S script is one of the very coolest things in, in Bitcoin, you know, any version of Bitcoin, but, uh, Shawway created this, uh, you know, really high level and low level scripting language that allows people to really interact with Bitcoin script. Uh, and there's a handful of people who do, and they understand it and they've been, uh, digging into how to do it, uh, better. But, um, I, I think these kind of like dev workshop hackathons are, are some of the best ways to get, uh, some of the more experienced developers with the people who, you know, have maybe taken a look at it, maybe taken a stab at it and, uh, get them all working together and, and, uh, rock and roll. And with, with all the people coming, I'm, I'm super excited to see the speakers list and, uh, all the people coming out. I, I will personally be presenting on, uh, jungle bus and how, um, like a miner interacts like as a, as a node, or I, I like to use the term a web three ISP in the, in the space. So, uh, I, I, I love the open interplay between, uh, Gorilla Pool as a company, uh, Jungle Bus as a, as a software product, and then Script as a software product, and then the OneSat Ordinals uh, stuff. Uh, all of that working interoperably. That's that's the big dream in Bitcoin. So if you uh, if you want to work in the interoperable Bitcoin space, like you should come to this Script hackathon. Plus, uh, yeah, I mean that, that part of San Francisco is just cool. I haven't been out there in probably six or seven years now, so I'm excited to come back and uh, see the city too. Yeah, it's going to be at the Fairmont, the top of Knob Hill, and one of the best neighborhoods. Uh, it's really clean there. And so we definitely are looking forward to having it, man. It's going to be great. Can't wait yeah. to see you. Looking forward to so, it. So, yeah, okay, let's dive right into this court case and we could just jump into that. I mean, and, you know, right now, just to kind of recap where we're at, we're going into closing arguments on Monday. And so mm -hmm. this week has been an off week. Uh, they've been Actually, writing the closing Tuesday. Week. Now, now that you mention it, oh I Tuesday think is off still. It's Tuesday. Monday's an off yep. day. It starts Tuesday. So right now they're submitting closing briefs by I don't know if it's Monday, but they're they're they have yeah. to submit them. I think it's under a thousand pages each. So <laughs> giant <Yeah>. closing <laughs> <Good> briefs. <luck. laughs> so so uh, where where are we? I mean, we we we've probably talked a lot. I mean, I'm sure you've talked a lot about it. But where are we? We went through expert witnesses from COPA. Expert witnesses for Craig. Craig submitted on some expert witnesses. I mean, just go ahead and just unload on where where you think we are in this case. I think, I mean, yeah, it's it's a the kind of thing you got to take by the shovel full. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, a, a lot has happened. Um, but for people only familiar with American court, I think it's really crucial to understand that in the UK, the stuff that you are presented is not the whole case. So you are really only presented with the things that both sides agreed needed to be argued on. And then the rest of the evidence, this whole body of evidence that was submitted uh, as paper or electronic or, or whatever else, uh, I guess even witness uh, statements and stuff, if there was not a disagreement in any of the other things that were submitted, that stuff is just sort of deemed to be agreed upon by both parties. And so uh, for anybody watching, I, I think it's very clear that the the COPA side and, and the sort of big blocker or Craig fan side uh, which in some ways are the same people and other other times not the same people. But, um, you know, they look at it and they say, hey, my side's clearly winning because the other side is clearly, you know, incompetent or malicious or whatever. But but if you're viewing it based on just the what we've seen in court, that's a that's a unfortunately a, a very limited view as to what the case is or how it's going. And so um, 
I, I would have kind of called it 50, 50 going into, you know, that last day of evidence. Um, and just kind of feeling like, man, no, neither side really had a knockout blow. I just didn't see anybody really get, get even a hold on the other side. Like Craig is, is, is more slippery than an eel, frankly, when he's on, on the stand. Uh, and I mean that in a good way. I mean, like he literally never got stuck except for the one, uh, the unsigned integer moment where he, he froze on stage it was probably his only moment, uh, where he even took a, you know, an extra breath, but. Um, but I'm, I'm frankly a little bit disappointed in that, you know, his side did not really come in. Like I was not more convinced that he's Satoshi Nakamoto and Copa didn't really do, uh, do a decent job of, of showing that he's not, I think they heavily implied that he is, um, you know, some kind of serial forger con man type, but that doesn't really address whether or not he's Satoshi. Um, and so just looking at the public part of this, I again, I'd, I'd say it was 50-50. But after all that was over and more of the actual evidence began to leak out, uh, or not leak out, but it, it becomes public after a certain point of time in the in the public record. And I've spent a little bit of time reading through uh, the uncontested evidence. And it's, it's fascinating to me just how much evidence that Copa was just like, yeah, we don't have an argument against it. And so... Um, it, it made me quite a bit more confident um, in, in Craig's side. So, for example, there were 26 pieces of and mostly un, uh, unnamed and unshown evidence, but uh, basically documentation, paperwork, like old proofs and stuff that they just like, we're not going to argue about these. And so while Judge Miller might be looking at the Myob stuff or the LaTeX file and seeing like, eh, this isn't this isn't great we don't know what these other 26 pieces of evidence are that he's looking at that both sides have said are real. I mean, th some of them could be, you know, hundred percent proofs of Craig being Satoshi. And so um, there's, there's a lot to consider. I, I don't, I don't envy judge Miller at all. I can't even imagine how much time it will take him uh, to do his deliberation after closing arguments. I, I would assume it would be weeks, frankly, but um I don't know. It's, it's, it's just fascinating. And I've, I've had a very, uh, I, so I guessed right on the previous one. So the Miami Ira Kleiman case, I, I guessed Craig would win it. The Norway one, uh, in, in, on the closing day of court over there, I said, man, I don't know. I think, I think, uh, the, the granite side had a, had a very strong closing. I don't think Craig's side finished as well. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of leaning toward a hold knot in that trial and, and that ended up being the case. And now, uh, with this one, I really, I'm just super torn because it's just, it's a little unfamiliar and, um, and there's a ton to consider that we just don't have the luxury of reading ourselves yet either. So, um, <laughs> sorry, I don't have a more definitive response on, uh, on what I think, but it's, it's, it's a weird one. So, uh, have you considered the, you know, what happened with, you know, the all-star witness being Madden, right? That's their, that's their yep. all-star guy. And he came forward and uh, he seemed to identify some problematic, you know, things that he came forward on mm -hmm. the stand. And I'm, I'm sure. wondering how you think that's going to affect the court's decision. Um, and, you know, you know, how that'll, yeah, just, I mean, one of the couple of things that he, he potentially admitted that Tristan wrote the report for the law yeah. firm. Yep. Uh, yeah, f finessed it, <laughs> which, which is the, the kind of word that I feel like would, would have a, an expert witness held in contempt in American court, frankly. Yeah, but it was, it was definitely seven, <laughs> six to six to eight days because it wasn't just yeah. like, oh, we met once, but he said, no, we met at my office three to four times and his office yep. three to four times. Yeah. All day work session. Yeah. No, that's, uh, honestly, th that's one of the major things that stood out to me is the both the incompetence isn't the right word because he's not incompetent, but, but a low level of qualification, um, like unacceptable. He, he could never work in the United States as a forensic, uh, expert witness, like not even close. And so the fact that he was the expert witness brought in, um, I, I don't even know what that implies. Yeah. Cause I mean, there's, there, there has to be better possible expert witnesses in that country. Right. So the fact that it was him, um, and it, at first I felt like he seemed like a very nice, normal guy, just a guy doing his job and whatever. And, you know, it's not his fault that, 
the, the threshold for qualifications is relatively low, but as it went on and, and like you said, he's, well, yeah, we did some preparation at bird and bird and yes, they, they helped me finesse the final report out and all it's like, wait, so not only, not only are you like not particularly good at this, but you're also potentially have this massive conflict of interest. <laughs> so I, I mean, if I was judge Miller on, on him specifically, I just would throw the whole thing out. How, how could you, how could you read anything in his report unless it was very clear which word was written by uh, Madden versus which words were written by, you know, that guy, Sebastian. <laughs> so it just strikes me as, as honestly insane. I, I found that baffling. Um, and if I was Craig's attorneys, that would be in my closing statements that, you know, we're, we're going to ask you uh, to, to have Madden's stuff thrown out entirely due to conflict of interest. And that's it. Like, unless he can identify word for word, which words are his and which words came from a bird and bird staff member. How, how could you even take his expert report? It, it just is crazy to me. That's absolutely. Yeah. That's a very good point. I mean, how could they take the expert report if he didn't write it, you know, so, and, or which <laughs> parts he did write and yeah. Uh, Hopefully so, he kept good notes. <laughs> yeah. So that, so that brings us over to Rosenthal. Now you remember he was, he seemed to be, he seemed to be more qualified Yes, uh, I don't even think, think they challenged his qualifications. He was so qualified. It was Correct. more of now. Now this was a little more technical on what they how this argument came about. So can you could you possibly summarize the you know the the the, the issues that we found with Rosenthal and how or, you know even issues just the the points on both sides. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, it's hard to question the qualifications of a, a guy with a German accent and a bow tie. So, <laughs> so um, but he basically was going into, um, I think more than anything, he was a typography uh, expert. So it, it was on him to basically explain the, um, the way that words were used in the creation of the LaTeX document. Uh, so he was brought in to sort of explain the reasons why or why not uh, certain aspects of the text would appear the way they do in the final output document. And, th you know, that's a, that's a very granular thing to jump into. But I, I think, he, first of all, he was really good in that he, he obviously knew the subject matter very deeply, but also that, that he was ready to admit that, you know, while it's his professional opinion that nobody would use this font in this way and, and, and that sort of thing, that of course it's possible uh, to, to have done that. And, and, and I think um, <laughs> he, like many of the witnesses actually that were on the stand, I, I think it was a little bit of wasted time in that it didn't, it didn't really establish anything concrete one way or another, which is kind of why I said I'm just still very wishy-washy on what we saw on the stand from almost everybody it like it's all very open to interpretation the way i saw it but um how did you take it what what did you think of his um his position on the mm -hmm. well there seemed to be a a very significant thing that stuck out stood out here with rosenthal and that was well his first was qualifications were sufficient it wasn't challenged on that what he was challenged on was whether or not you know, so if you remember right on Craig's testimony, they're reading the transcript that Craig had testified a few days earlier. And he says that when he was making the white paper, he was using Linux and I believe Windows. Is that right? But yeah, both. One, one of them was in a virtual machine. I believe it was the Linux that was in the virtual machine. Okay. And so then with Rosenthal, he his report was written on what he was familiar with, which I believe was Windows. Yes. Not Linux. Correct. So there was a missing, a complete missing. It's like the the whole comp, the whole report was missing an analysis based on Linux. Yeah, the way I understood it is that how you. Well, and and also using uh, a different LaTeX plugin as well. Uh, Craig, I think Craig said he used Lua LaTeX, and then Rosendahl used whatever the other version of LaTeX was, uh, and said like, well, that shouldn't matter. And well, it's like, well, yeah, lots of things shouldn't matter, but that isn't science. So if, if you didn't test the actual thing, it's kind of a shot in the dark. So yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So it seemed to be incomplete. Now, if that could be a possibility. Now, the one thing that also came up, if you remember, Craig had testified that Rosenthal was going to BTC conferences. He was a BTC whale. 
Well, where did I, that come from? Or where, I, what I don't know. I, I did a little bit of digging on that uh, and sort of trying to cross-reference Rosendahl and, um, and anything related to Bitcoin. Um, just kept bringing up stuff related to the trial because he'd been mentioned a lot by the Bitcoin Defense Fund and some of these other things. Um, so I don't know if that was some kind of a, a whitewash in order to make it, uh, hey, if we post his name a lot on all these other things, he'll be, you know, anything else he's ever done in the Bitcoin space will be on, you know, page 10 of Google or something. But um, yeah, I, I couldn't find anything. And he also didn't really come across as a kind of Bitcoin core dude. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I didn't get that vibe from him. It's totally possible. It was a, a name confusion thing on Craig's behalf too. I mean, that's not a, not a terribly uncommon name either. So, uh, you know, who, who knows, but Craig, yeah, Craig was obviously very, uh, both angry and confident about his criticism. Uh, but, but I don't know. I, I was not able to dig anything up myself. So, okay. So so yeah, with uh, with Rosenthal, we we we're, there was uh, he denied he denied any involvement in BTC. Yeah, uh, at said all. he has so no investments in anything. Not, yeah, he no essentially said I'm I'm very poor. I wish I had some Bitcoin or <laughs> something to that effect. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we went then went over with, with with we may want to touch on some of Craig's witnesses, but I just want to pick mm -hmm. these for apart first. And that was uh, we had the lady, the professor. Do you remember her name? She was challenging uh, Zem Gao. Mikkel, Mikkel John. Mikkel, Mikkelson. Mikkel. M Mikkel John. Mikkel John. Yeah. Professor Mikkel John. Uncommon one. Yeah. Yeah. And she's, uh, I think she was a, um, if I wanted, I think she was from Stanford, if I recall, but now, now living in London. You know, and it's interesting. Um, actually, before we go to that, you know, did you notice how we, I want to go back to Madden. I forgot to bring this up. When, yeah. when Madden was done on the first time, do you remember how Craig's counsel got up and submitted without bringing forward the experts for, for Craig? Mm -hmm. He, and, and, and then the next day Hoff gets up and he says, yeah, you know, my Lord, we didn't get a chance to cross examine Dr. Wright's experts. Uh, they yeah. were a little, they were disheveled. Like it was just like, oh, they were expecting to. And they said, will yep. you take in these, the joint report into evidence? And this, and then Cal Council Wright says, no objection. Yep. I mean, that, the, I mean, what is your thoughts on that? Because that's like, you know, it's, it's a weird one. And, and that might be, it might be why uh, the, the folks from Shoesmiths did not decide to even bring some of these people in. Like, I, I don't know if the rule is that they can't be cross-examined if they aren't examined in the first place. Um, that, that might be the case, but I, I thought it was, um, I thought it was bizarre that the Shoesmiths people just didn't bother examining, <laughs> you know, basically half of the people that came up. Um, and, and that's either one of two things. I, I, I think you could take that one of two ways. It is either they are so confident that it is just unnecessary to bring them up onto the stage uh, and and risk them, you know, having a bad cross examination, I suppose. Uh, or the other one is, you know, they're they're I, I guess incompetent would be the response. Like if if Craig loses this resoundingly because there was no uh, exam of some of Craig's witnesses, I, I think it'll come down to like, man, Shoesmith really fumbled the ball. But if Craig wins it, then it'll be like, wow, okay. Uh, Schusmus strategically uh, chose not to examine people, and it and it paid off. So, uh, but I, I don't know. It's it's a it's a very weird game of chess. The the whole thing has been uh, very very difficult for me to read, and I, I I kind of think it's a little bit because I'm American, but um, <laughs> I don't know. It definitely was a very bold move to hold back those experts because yeah. if you hoff was expecting to get a get a chance on them he was like ready to attack uh yeah. and just by holding them back it seemed like a last minute decision uh like right before yeah and it, it it did well and it, and it could be it could be a little bit because of the the email leak thing at the end with the the email with auntie and you know like yeah maybe, maybe we just better not bring in more witnesses that who knows may, may have had to agree that like, yeah, it's possible that Craig cheated like this or possible that he cheated like that. It was kind of uh, the unfortunate uh, aspect of Zem Gao on the stand who had he been asked good questions. Zem, Zem is one of the best explainers of Bitcoin that I know. So of course Huff is just going to keep asking him like, 
Is it possible that Craig spoofed Electrum? Is it possible that he spoofed the Wi-Fi? Is it possible that he overtook the router? Is it possible? And so, and obviously the answer is yes. There's there's a million things Craig could have done to lie, but that isn't, uh, that's not even, that's not even useful information. Everybody knows he could have lied. And and asking them those things, um, you know, is, is to be expected from Huff. But that's my other big, like, man, this sucks about Shoesmiths is that they did not then ask Zem Gao a bunch of very relevant information about like, okay, do you think anyone but Satoshi could have invented Terranode? Or, you know, like, just like feed him some softballs to just put some information out into the into the public record. And like, no, we're not going to question him. <laughs> so I think Zem uh, felt a little bit like, man, why, why did I come out for this? <laughs> So, yeah. So, yeah, that really wasn't much. They, they was them. They attacked him on his blog. They wanted right. to, that was the, the whole thing. They wanted to attack and say that he was supporting Craig and he thought Craig yeah. was Satoshi according to his blog. So yeah. how, what do you think the impact of that is? Uh, minimal. I mean, Zem, Zem comes across as a, as a genuine person. I mean, he's a like boldly states his, his Christian faith on all of his public stuff. He boldly states what he believes and how he comes to a decision about what he believes to be the truth. And so he's just a guy who is, you know, shows up at the door, states all of his biases and says, can we be friends? And, uh, you know, how could you dislike a guy like that? And then, you know, on the other side, you have, uh, uh, you know, Professor Meeklejohn, for example, saying, oh, I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with rs coin and yeah it was a paper i wrote and i did a little digging into that and the other guy uh who co-wrote the paper issued some code and some coins actually were created and she said oh no it never became a thing so she's she was trying to hide the fact that she was uh maybe not intimately involved in implementation but was definitely involved in the in the writing of a white paper for a competing cryptocurrency and so you know, if she's looked at as, oh, well, she's the, she's the unbiased, uh, objective person here. And Zen Gao is the, is the biased Cretan. I, I just think it comes across as very, um, frankly, very typical of, of how these sort of arguments go. Uh, when you argue with these people, they just say, look, the, the world assumes we're right. And so our version of the truth is the objective truth and you have to deal with it. And, that's just not the case. And and I love the fact that somebody like Zem is willing to say, I'm not going to take my blog down. I do. I think it's very obvious that Craig is Satoshi. And if you'd like to ask me why, I could sit and talk about it all day. <laughs> and so that's that's what you want in a, in a in any kind of person, frankly. You want somebody who knows what they believe and why they believe it, and they can explain to you under pressure why they have come to the, that decision about why it's their belief. And, uh, and again, I, th I just think it's tragic that Zem didn't get to talk about uh, m more of his logic and, and how he came to any of those conclusions. And so, yeah, it's just a, it's, it's a bit of a clash of culture, frankly, like small blockers want to obfuscate and keep people confused and it's all, it's anonymity and yeah, don't, don't we all get involved in a little bit of crime and you know, your big blockers here are just like, hey, man, I'm an open book. Like, it's a public ledger. Isn't it, isn't it great when, when the truth is just out there? And I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's a weird thing. So uh, let's go a couple of the other witnesses that came up. We got Matthews. And then the one that they, they brought in to counter Matthews was, was Mike, uh, Mike Hearn. Yep. Now, you remember there's a tribal issue. Uh, there's a dispute. Uh, this This could be going both ways, a dispute on the actual dinner. Remember how Matthews yep. testified that it was Hearn that called to set up the dinner. Hearn yeah. specifically said he yeah. did not do that. This is, uh, and, and it was actually John Matonis that contacted him. He also sure. said that he was not involved in any sort of patent or intellectual property projects. Matthew says that he believed he was. So yeah. how, how does, how does that part uh, play out here? Um, you know, I, I, I really think in that specific situation, I think Matthews and Hearn are just such different people that they don't communicate to each other well. Because listening to both guys 
explaining the story, the, the conversation was happening a little bit through John Matonis. And so I could see both parties being completely honest about the way they perceived it and having them both telling the truth, frankly, that like, no, I invited, or no, he invited me. Both, both sides are saying he invited me. But if it came through John, I could see John being the one saying, hey, Stefan, should we invite Mike? And Stefan's saying, yeah, I guess invite Mike. And then John saying, hey, Mike, Stefan would really like you to come to dinner. You know, it's like maybe John's the guy padding the story. And, you know, all that context is lost when you're asking both guys directly, who brokered this thing? <laughs> it's like, I don't know. He wanted me to come. So I, 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 I think that that comes across just based on the way that it all went down. That's kind of the way I see it. And also knowing that John is kind of a peacemaker. John's another guy who I've studied quite a bit. Um, and John's a, John's a peace broker. So I could see John being the guy to say both directions. Hey, Mike would love to meet you. And Hey, Stefan would like to meet you. And so then both guys feel like, I don't know, I guess I should go have dinner with this guy. Now, I also saw a little bit of commentary from Ian Grigg, uh, who is, we know, a, a, a friend of Craig's and, and at the very least a, a powerful ally of Craig's, um, but also has had a long time working relationship with Mike Hearn. They both worked at R3 uh, with the Corda stuff together. And so uh, Ian had a has had a more recent and good working relationship with Mike. Uh, and Ian recalled that Mike was pretty excited to to meet Craig because Craig might be Satoshi Nakamoto. So, you know, the fact that Mike was saying like, oh, I, I don't know, I didn't I didn't know what to think and, and that kind of thing, I think was him kind of trying to play it down a little bit. But Ian uh, Ian's post on Twitter, he basically said, no, I, I remember telling Mike and Mike was kind of excited, which, you know, sh Mike shouldn't be embarrassed about. But I think the undertone or what, what everybody needs to know about Mike is before Craig, Mike was the most ruthlessly bullied person in Bitcoin. Um, nobody took more heat than Mike for many years because Mike was much like Craig. He was a super big blocker, believed that Bitcoin was capable of anything. And he was also a sort of law and legal compliance kind of guy too, saying, hey, like Bitcoin should integrate into everything. But if it does, it needs to, it needs to follow these rules. And he was dealing with a bunch of anarchists who didn't want to hear any of it either. So Mike... Uh, Mike got bullied out of BTC a, a lot the ways that, that Craig is being bullied today. And so I kind of don't blame Mike for not wanting to uh, hitch any of his wagon to Craig at this point. Cause he's like, man, I just can't take any more abuse. So it's, it's a little bit uh, understandable. And then on the patent thing, I also think that was kind of a misunderstanding. Like the way that they were talking about, Mike was saying, I, you know, I was just asking Craig basic questions about Bitcoin, but Stefan was acting like I was asking him about Bitcoin related IP and some of the secret end chain stuff. And, and I think the problem is, is that Mike comes from a place where Bitcoin is open source software discussing anything about Bitcoin. It's not really anybody's property, but on the Craig side, everything about Bitcoin is intellectual property and, and it's his intellectual property. And so I, I could see that again as a, as a failure to sort of understand the, the presuppositions of, of the other party. So I, I, I really think that it's at, at the very least, it's possible that, that both sides are just for whatever reason, don't communicate very well with each other. Um, but then we saw the, the follow-up is, is the fact that Mike, has indeed been involved in patents uh, related to blockchain tech over at R3 and stuff. Uh, I, I've not dug into uh, exactly what those relevant patents would be. Like, do they look like end-chain patents? I didn't get that sleuthy about it, but um, it, it, it seems to be like Mike and Craig should be allies. And uh, I think it's really unfortunate if they just aren't allies because of uh, you know, bad brokering of relationship stuff. And I don't know. All right. So good. Yeah. Good summary on, on Matthews and, and Hearn and, and Craig as well. And so there is one witness for, for Craig, which I think the Copa is going to use most of their firepower in their closing to attack. And that was Craig's business uh, associate, from back in 2006 era, even earlier, 
and I'm I'm drawing a blank on his name, but this is the one that brought up Timecoin. Uh, Jenkins. Jenkins. Yeah. So you want to summarize? Can you mind summarizing a little bit on Jenkins? Because I think this is going to be where Copa is going to going to focus their closing on on trying to yeah. discredit Jenkins. Sure. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I've I've actually met. Um, I think it was David Jenkins. Um. We met in Oslo because he was a, a witness over there and he appeared in person. And I uh, didn't have a lot of English speaking friends while I was in Oslo. So uh, when he was around after court, I ended up kind of just talking to him and we uh, had like a, I don't even know what you would call it. Just like a, there were snacks basically back at, uh, back at an office where we uh, got to hang out. I wanted to ask him some questions about Craig that were off the record. And so um, super nice guy, first of all. Um, really forthright, just a just an honest businessman with a ton of experience in relevant business. I mean, he was a serious executive at Vodafone um, and a bunch of these other uh, big big companies out there. And so uh, he, he just comes across as really genuine to me. Um, just just having the career that he's had in being a high level executive at lots of places and moving up in his career consistently because of his performance i mean that's that's a guy that's good at building relationships and good at building trust and um you know the fact that uh, he pulled time coin out of out of his hat uh you know in the last two minutes obviously is is super damning because if he is telling the truth i mean that's it that's the case if, if you could prove that he had mentioned a time not that we can just go back and listen to a conversation from 17 years ago or whenever it happened. But, but if that's true, that's the whole case. That's it. It's over because the time coin white paper is clearly a, a predicate piece of technology for, for Bitcoin and the Bitcoin white paper. And so him bringing that up is, is a massive bombshell. And obviously we can't prove it one way or another. And so what they're going to do is absolutely try to impugn his credibility. I'm sure there's been a paralegal uh, or two or three spending the last 10 days or more trying to figure out like, has this guy ever cheated on his wife? Has he ever cheated on his taxes? Has he ever, you know, it's like, we have to find something terrible this man has done to explain why he is just a lying cretin. But if he, you know, even it could even be like, hey, he's, He's poor, which means he could be bribed for less than a hundred thousand dollars to lie or something. But you know, if he's wealthy and paid off his home and has a happy family and all these other things, they're going to have a really hard time, uh, you know, explaining why he would just lie for Craig, potentially, you know, be in contempt of court and all these other things. And I, I just think it's pretty clear uh, at face value why he has no reason to lie. There, there is zero reason for him to lie. He has no direct connection to Craig at all. He's not doing any business with him. He he seems, you know, a guy that's been a, you know, C-level executive at major corporations for the last 25 years probably doesn't need the money. And um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think they're going to have a hard time uh, getting that one to be squashed because the corruption thing just doesn't really make a lot of sense. So yeah. So back, you know, back to the way that this time coin kind of came out in the transcript, if you remember, mm -hmm. uh, he was under examination and what was, what was said? Uh, how did it come up? So he, he was talking about the way that Craig works, that, that Craig would show up, that they would have coffee or, or a light lunch together every once in a while. And Craig would always bring him paper written notes, which everybody finds just disgusting that, Oh, of course they've got to be paper. So there's no metadata, but I can actually confirm I've had, a working lunch or two with Craig and he does always show up with white lined paper and he chicken scratches. He does like Craig's a nightmare to work with in that regard. Cause I'm also the kind of guy that wants to read things typed, but um, Craig's always got paper notes and he's always got kind of scribbly stuff. And then he, he'll be tapping on the paper in front of you and he's explaining and explaining and explaining. He's just got this fire that won't get, it won't stop flowing out of him when he's excited about his topic. And so what Jenkins uh, explained is that um, I believe he was asked again and said, okay, well, do you recall anything specific about these, you know, this specific coffee meeting or this specific lunch meeting? And he's like, I don't know. He was always talking about distributed computing and, and timestamp server. Like that was a thing he always talked about. And he said, I guess, I guess I remember him one time saying time coin and... <laughs> 
And that was the, you literally hear the grumble from the Copa, the, the you know, paper start moving. <laughs> you know, it's, oh no. And, you know, but it, the way he presented it is it was just one of the chicken scratched pieces of paper said time coin on it that he recalled. And then it was immediately, are, are you reading off of a piece of paper? Do you have notes in front of you? Do you have a pen? And he's, yeah, I'm sitting here writing. And then he holds up. I, I just wrote that down. I, I've i been taking notes the whole time. And they're trying to say he's got a cheat sheet in front of him sent by, uh, you know, Stephen Matthews and the bonded courier, I guess. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, it seemed like that was the, um, uh, yeah, he wrote down time coin in his notes throughout the conversation. Yeah. wasn't clear whether it was written down before or whether it was written down after they're going to attack that little nuance. For sure. I guarantee at the very least there there's a paralegal whose job it was to watch his whole examination frame by frame to see if he is glancing down and if he can see his shoulder wiggling as if he were taking notes. So I, I don't know, maybe we'll get to see a really drawn out video analysis of uh, David Jenkins shoulder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it is that significant. I mean, like you said, if, if that's, if that comes in as evidence and it's taken as true, the case is over. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's a very credible witness, uh, you know, who, who has uh, an incredible story to tell I, on top of all the other ones. I mean, some of them were goofy. Like I didn't think, uh, Ignatius Pang and the Lego story was very compelling. And, you know, the, the sister telling the ninja suit story isn't exactly proof that he's Satoshi, but, but a couple of them were, and that included Jenkins and um, I forget the other one. He was a bank executive uh, had, had quite a similar story, not time coin specifically, but the same kind of thing, like timestamp servers and trying to get us to do interbank, uh, you know, distributed compute for transferring money and that kind of thing. Uh, was it Sinclair? Was that Neville Sinclair? Sinclair, I don't think made it. It was a, it was a, I can't remember his name. Shoot. Yeah. I, I don't remember either. So he was great though. He had the best Australian accent. <laughs> and then also, uh, Craig's cousin. We forgot about him. Yes. Yes. He's, he's, I've also met him in person, Max, Max Linum. Um, funny. Cause he's, also, like they didn't go into any of his qualifications. Obviously, you want to disqualify um, people whose expertise is not uh, not great. But Max has spent the last 30, maybe even more uh, years of his life as a very high level uh, IT security. He's a programmer, all these other things. Uh, if I recall, he was a pretty serious C++ coder and doing machine level coding on uh, little micro units. He was explaining he touched on it very briefly that there were computer systems that were used on the farm. Now what the farm was doing, get this, the farm was a tulip farm. So people do not realize that, you know, everybody's like, Oh, this tulip thing, you just made this up. It's like, no, I actually know for a fact that Craig's family had an e-commerce, but one of the first e-commerce businesses in the world, and they were selling hand-picked tulips from the family farm preceding Bitcoin. And that they had some automated systems for, I don't know if it was the watering or, or what, but there were some automated systems that were custom built by either Max and or Craig. I don't remember exactly the details, but they built these machines, coded them up, and they were, it was like this automated farm process for these tulips. And they were doing international um, shipping, like next day air tulips from Australia and the funny thing is that they stopped doing it in 2008 because of the uh, the, the global financial crisis, which kind of killed their business. But um, Max, so anyways, Max is, is an extremely uh, competent tech witness. Um, and for him, he was just like, yeah, it's, it's super obvious what Craig was working on here. Like these are distributed systems. It was, it was a timestamp server again. It was yeah, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't just obviously be Bitcoin here because what the hell else would it have been that we were, you know, mining on our computers basically. So yeah, he's, he's another interesting one. The problem obviously is that he's Craig's cousin. And so there's, there, there's that conflict of interest, but he's, he's not the only one saying the exact same story. So he just would have been closer to Craig because he's family and saying, yeah, on the family side, 
he tried to get us to use our 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 internal tulip computers to do his bitcoin mining too which is funny that craig called his bitcoin supercomputer the tulip supercomputer a number of years later so there's there's more now stuff the, there is now that you brought the tulip up it may be a good time to, to go into the tulip trust and and now the yeah. it seems like this tulip trust is now uh all of a sudden coming relevant again from the old climbing case and yeah. i don't know have you been following what's what's been going on i mean there's the you know, the the court documents from 2019 were uh, looks like 475 pages of 75,000 addresses were put in by uh, fact witness shatters. Oh yeah, and yep. Some of those addresses now appear to have been uh, <laughs> selling coins. I, do you know how many? And and can you talk uh, a little bit about that? Lots, like over over a hundred million dollars worth of uh, BTC. So um, and lots of them from uh, from an era where. Uh, it's it's very likely that they were Satoshi mined blocks, um, and some of them do indeed very specifically appear on the Shatters list, which um, we we know for a fact is not a perfect list. Uh, it was it was shown to be um, you know ha have a limited accuracy, but but it was so many of the addresses that you know, your odds of them being right uh, end up going up. Um, unfortunately, I mean, I can only speculate like Craig, if it's Craig, Craig deserves his privacy, but, um, <laughs> the problem with being, uh, doxxed and, you know, maybe Satoshi and all that stuff is that everybody's monitoring everything that could conceivably be your property. So, uh, no, that's, it's, it's very interesting. The timing is much more interesting given that he's supposed to, uh, you know, pay out part of the settlement to IRA and all, all this other stuff related over here. So, Timing, timing looks at well. Craig got a big bill, and then Satoshi coins move <laughs> within the next forty-eight hours. Uh, that it's compelling, but uh, unfortunately, it's it's nothing but compelling until further notice. We we don't know what it means, frankly. Yeah, sure is a <laughs> it's another mystery to this puzzle, yeah. but it's all. Uh, I mean, you really it's going to come. Isn't it going to come down to for Copa that they've got a. I mean, clearly we've got all these these loose ends on the Craig side, right? I mean, okay, let's just say that he's done an okay job. But now Copa's still got to show that it is conceivably for sure certain that he is this serial forger, that it all is all completely a lie, and that Madden, Rosenthal, and the professor have, have proven that. I mean, they yeah. have to they have to establish that in these expert reports. Yep. So I mean, uh, and I I don't think they've done that at all. I mean, like both sides. I again, I don't think Craig made a compelling case in court that he is Satoshi. Like it's it's intriguing, but it's not convincing. But it's the exact same thing on the Copa side. They they've made an intriguing case that he's a serial forger, but they've not convinced. I'm certainly not me, and I I I don't know. I just I just I find it I find both sides uh, their performances to have been quite weak, frankly. So. Uh, I, I really don't know how to call it based on, uh, based on what we saw in court, but, uh, the interesting, the interesting thing is that it really does hinge on just a thing or two, right? If, if, for example, there is a single piece of evidence that even the word Bitcoin was used in a file or something somewhere that precedes the publication of the Bitcoin white paper, I mean, that's it. Like Craig really needs one thing. He needs one little thing for this to just be, all right, that's it. It's a blowout. Maybe he is a perjurer and a fraud and a liar and, and all these other things. Doesn't matter. If if he has a, 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 a single piece of evidence of, okay, here's a paragraph from the Bitcoin white paper that is sterile and precedes the publication of it. Like that, that's it. <laughs> so... So it, it really is one of those one of those kind of things where, you know, it can look like there's a mountain of of evidence that is, uh, you know, rotten, but it's very very simple to to have this go the other way. So it could even be that like his tax records. I, I think that's a fascinating thing. Craig has said for years. Oh yeah, no, I filed in 2010. I filed Bitcoin on my 2009 tax records, both the R and D credits but also the Bitcoin income. And so like, 
<laughs> what I can't figure out is actually has have his tax returns been submitted as evidence? I, I did not see them in the evidence, but that strikes me as a very easy one. If those exist, that should be the end of that story as far as I'm concerned too. But that's what I mean about this case being very weird. It's it's very unclear what is in the final evidence packet uh, that Meller is even getting to read. The tax returns are definitely there because if you remember, we had uh, the witness and it wasn't Dr. Pham, but it was the other gentleman that was Craig's most dear friend. Uh, and he's, mm -hmm. he, he was his partner back in 2010 era. And he was a si oh, he was silent. Yes. Uh, Yusuf. You, Mr. Yusuf, show, most show dear Yusuf. friend. It was a character yeah. witness. And yeah. You know, he that was where they were trying to attack the tax things. And, and it was taken out of t context a little bit. Uh, and they were trying to bring up a determination by the tax court that was not. Uh, you, you know, do you have a being the historian that you are? Can you take us back into that a little bit more? Uh, the specifics? Yeah, unfortunately, that's that's another kind of rat's nest of information because everybody sort of refers to it as tag or uh, Craig's tax problem. But it's not a problem. There's actually Craig has had multiple personal and corporate tax problems, multiple audits, multiple, it, it got to the point where there was uh, like a tribunal and all these other things. And so Craig, uh, Craig's tax problems are themselves, like maybe even a dozen individual inquiries and, and legal cases in Australia. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to <laughs> hear my kid crying down the hallway. Um, but yeah, it's 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 another one that gets exceedingly complex. And part of it is because Craig has like a dozen companies because he's kind of a madman like that. So he had a an overarching management company, which I think was De Morgan at the top, and then um and then the trusts, and then he had his hotwire PE and coin and uh oh goodness, um Cloudcroft and you know, but another half a dozen more. And so uh, getting into all of his taxes would be another just behemoth tax, uh, a task probably. But uh, Shob Yusuf also basically said exactly that. Like, yeah, it was, this was coin coin. He told me it was a supercomputer research company. I didn't see the computer, but that's all the notes I ever saw. And then I, I think the other interesting thing that came out of that is that Stephen Matthews and Calvin's people and, and whoever else did whatever due diligence necessary and decided to buy the intellectual property out of that company based on their due diligence. And, you know, everybody can say, well, Calvin's just an idiot or a, or a scammer or something, but like Calvin's a self-made billionaire and, and he definitely had the resources to do his due diligence properly. Uh, and it was not done in a short time frame or under pressure or anything. He didn't have to buy any of this, but he had his people look at it. They looked at it for months and months. This includes McGregor and some of these other people like going through the files and, hey, is there any value to these claims that Craig is making about being Satoshi or being even just this inventor of all this amazing Bitcoin related intellectual property? And the answer was a resounding yes. And so all of that stuff, both the tax debts, and th this is actually pretty key here even if all of Craig's IP was super valuable, I, if I'm in Calvin's position, there's a guy here with like, you know, potentially tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in tax problems that I might be acquiring as part of my acquisition of this IP. Personally, I'd walk away. I, I wouldn't want it. And so Calvin looked at this massive risky, you know, opening himself up to risk with another country's tax office and said, I think that it is valuable enough for me to take the risk on Craig and his tax issues and his legal issues and his reputation and his attitude and everything else and saying, I'm going to invest in this guy. The, the, there has to be something in there that is just mind blowing. <laughs> so I, I just, I can't see it any other way. Like I've watched how Calvin does business and Calvin is, he's a, a tough and shrewd businessman. So everybody likes to make, oh, Craig just bamboozled Calvin and Calvin's just this dummy. Like, no, that is not how Calvin functions. And that in and of itself, if you know Calvin, you know that due diligence was done 
deeply and and the decisions to invest in Craig and, and all the rest that's happened was done uh, with with a whole lot of, of consideration. So there's there's definitely interesting stuff behind whatever curtain that is. All right, that's a really good point. And this is this is going to be a tough question. So brace yourself. But it, oh it, it, uh, I think it's something that everybody wants to know the answer to. Mm -hmm. And then you brought up Calvin. Um, people want to know uh, where Ager Hansen came from. How did he get into the uh, how did he get into the picture? Was it how exactly did that happen? I mean, where, I, who made the decision? I, I wish I knew. I, I really genuinely don't know. Um, it seems to me it almost gets a little bit like kind of eyes wide shut weird because where they allegedly met by accident was that like a American express black card holders ball or something like that, which, you know, when I, when I'm picturing that kind of a thing, like black tie over in like Switzerland or whatever, that always just immediately strikes me as like weird Illuminati nonsense party. Uh, so them being there, like, Man, I don't know. I, I don't know how that world works. I, I don't know how creepy it gets. I, I have my theories, but they're only theories. I'm I'm a middle class guy when it comes down to it. But but Edgar Hansen, uh, when I was introduced to him, he came on my show, uh, was kind of his introduction to to the BSB community. Um, but it was based on him having this relationship with Kyle Roche. And and technically it was Kyle Roche that made him a public figure in regards to any of this. It was Kyle that posted, oh my God, it's Kristen Ager Hansen that is leaking my information. And so I remember Kyle Roche saying this in public and saying, okay, who's Kristen Ager Hansen? Uh, did a little bit of searching into it and like realized he's on Twitter and stuff. Uh, and I was talking to my editorial board and saying, hey, is this somebody, um, this is over at CoinGeek. I was saying, hey, should, should we get this guy's side of the story? This guy just got brought into all this leaking about, about, uh, Roche over here. And, um, you know, the editorial before board N-Chain. Like, What's that? Before N-Chain. Way yeah. before N-Chain. Like okay. six months before so, the N-Chain stuff. Quick background on Kyle Roche. He was, uh, opposing counsel in Kleiman. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. He okay. was, a uh, Roche Friedman firm, uh, that is a spinoff of, um, Boy Schiller Flexner, which is one, one of the biggest firms in the country. And, um, but there, he's young. Kyle, Kyle looked like he's maybe 30 and, um, uh, Fr Friedman, uh, same thing. They're just like young guy, good litigators, like really talented in the courtroom, but, um, <laughs> lost the case. But, uh, but Roche, then it was all this corruption of, oh, Roche drank a bunch and was talking about just all this corruption related to Craig and, uh, also, uh, even Guns Rare and Avalanche and just all this other stuff that came out, uh, Roche ended up leaving the firm and all this stuff, like basically ruined his career. Um, so I thought Kristen at, at first, I found him interesting. Um, when we finally made contact, uh, through like my comms about, Hey, should we interview this guy with coin geek? Um, and he was immediately like, Oh yeah, I'll come right on your show. I actually wanted to do like a written interview and publish an article. Cause I'm like, I don't know. I don't know who this guy is. But he was like, oh, yeah, no, I'll come on your show. Let's let's talk about it. This whole thing with Kyle is crazy. I was like, okay, this guy's kind of spicy. Let's let's have him on, you know? And uh, so he came on and we just literally talked about Kyle Roche and stuff for, for the hour. And it's like, cool, thanks, man. Like, good, good luck. Thanks for coming on the show. I didn't talk to him off air or anything. It was just like, okay, cool. Moving on with my life. And then um, and then a couple weeks later, uh, it was suggested to have him on again because more stuff had kind of come out about Kyle. Uh, but then I realized uh, Kristen, Kristen was kind of having conversations with some of the brass over at like N-Chain. And, and I think it was actually Craig. So Craig came back to Twitter and then Craig said on Twitter, oh, Kristen Ager Hansen uh, sort of nudged me into getting back on social media. And I was like, wait, why is Craig talking to Kristen Hager Hansen? And so that was the, the first time I was like, oh, okay, maybe he's involved in more than I know. So I'm I'm not in anybody's like inner circle for here's where end chain's going or anything of that. Uh, but but all of a sudden, like Kristen's part of this conversation. And I, I just, I don't know. I can't imagine not doing the due diligence because I mean, you can spend 20 minutes on Google and realize the guy's a, 
got, got a past. He's he has a past of being a, a corporate raider. He'll he'll say as much. It, it's his quote about himself is that he's a corporate raider and yeah. he's there to do he calls himself a Viking. Necessary to win. Yeah, he, he, says he, a, he calls himself a Viking. He's a Viking, which is fine. I'm like 20% Swedish. I can relate, but <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. Just that whole saga is, is pretty baffling to me though. Cause yeah. It, so it came out in court uh, that Ager Hansen uh, went into the, this was Stefan Mashers. He went into the end yep. chain office with, uh, with the security detail and then kicked everybody out. Right. And apparently, I mean, according to Stefan, it, <laughs> If you look back at his past, there there have been multiple people accusing him of, you know, threatening witnesses, like like hardcore witness tampering, people feeling like they need to call the police after having a conversation with Kristen. So this is all stuff that's on the public record from his past. Um, so I, you know, I I don't know. I I <laughs> until the the video footage leaks of you know. Kristen's people kicking the door in an end chain and spray painting the security camera lens. I, I, I don't know. It's... You know. And how, so how about the, you know, it was Matthews that was testifying that there was a meeting with Edgar Hansen about Craig testifying. No, about him testifying in the case. And yep. he brought him into an office. I don't know. Was that at Matthew's office or Edgar Hansen's office? And then the, the, it was I something mean, like Chris. It sounded, like, it sounded like Matthew's office. Desk. What was yeah. it? How did it go? Yeah, like up, like spitting in his face and pounding his fist. And you're, you're <laughs> going to go to, you're going to go to prison if you testify. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's not, I mean, sounds, sounds terrifying. I mean, Stefan, Stefan's a big dude and Kristen could, you know, fit in my shirt pocket. So I, I don't know how, how threatened I would feel in that situation, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and now there's some, there are some other uh, actions that have been filed apparently by Unchain and injunctions, which have been yep. issued. Apparently not been responded to by by Ager Hansen, and they've just gone into into default? judgment or Presumably? default. Huh? I, so I don't know. I haven't seen that. I, I wonder. You know, we'll see if the court's taking notice of that and the relevance of it. Because if uh, uh, you know, it's 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 just an interesting little more drama into this into this big high profile well, case. Just just going off of his history. And if you look at the history of Kristen and his potential witness tampering and stuff, and then Craig saying on the stand that, Hey man, we got attacked by and, and threatened by this Kristen guy. Like that sounds very, uh, you know, on script for that character. So, <laughs> you know, again, it, it actually adds credibility to both Stefan and Craig's uh, version of the story. So, <sighs> and we also, I mean, he's admitted publicly that, that's what he does for his career is he takes money from the highest bidder to do corporate espionage. Like that's not, that's not an accusation from people to him. That is his resume from him to the world. So that's his, that's his resume. <laughs> yeah, like he's the guy's, the guy is not ashamed of it. So, you know, I, I don't think it's even controversial to say that it's entirely possible that he was a plant from day one. It, that's the profile he sets out for himself. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it definitely creates a, uh, if he was, um, we don't know if he was planted by the other side, but somebody obviously, if he, it was a motive. So, well, uh, you know, we're coming up on on uh, on just about an hour here. So any anything else you want to add? I mean, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing you next uh, next weekend in San Francisco. And sure. we're going to be back on trial on Tuesday. So you're probably going to be yeah. reporting that again. Oh, How yeah. can people find more about you, follow you and in, in anything you're doing? I'm Kurt Wooker JR everywhere. So you can go to kurtwookerjr.com. You can hit me there on x.com or telegram or wherever else. Um, you know, give me a follow. Uh, I really appreciate paid subscribers. Uh, you know, people, people like to criticize me for taking money from anyone who I take money from. Apparently uh, if I accept a dollar from anyone, it is a, an obvious sign of corruption, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but much like Zem and Gao, I, I state my biases right at the get go. And, and I, I think I uh, think I stick to my guns pretty well. So um, yeah, it, so, social media is great. I, I love the follows. I love when people watch the coin geek weekly live stream. It's Tuesdays at 2 PM Eastern standard time. Uh, I love taking live questions uh, from the audience and, uh, I'm an open book. So absolutely join, join me. And uh, thanks for having me, Gavin. I'm looking forward to seeing you next weekend too. Likewise, Kurt. We'll end it there. We'll see you at the top, buddy. Thank you. Thank you.